We've been talking about love and war. And contrasting, looking at how the nature of God, sometimes we want to see God one way. Right? Sometimes we want to see God after our favorite fairy tale or just our favorite scriptures. Who's got a favorite scripture? Man, yeah. Sometimes we just want to, I think of sometimes K-Love. Who listens to K-Love? Isn't K-Love good? Their tagline is positive, encouraging K-Love. Don't you love that? Because I always, you know, we just love positive, encouraging. And sometimes I think we want to only think of, of the scriptures that are positive, encouraging, right? Because we need that. We need that life. But uh, sometimes we can box God into our, our idea of who he is. And uh, there's a lot of aspects of the Lord. You know, it says in 1 John that God is love. Amen. Now, your idea of what love may be may be based on what you grew up or how you saw your parents love each other or just some emotional form of love, you know, it, it might not exactly be God's version of love. So it's important to find out what that means from the Word of God. We also see in the Word, it says God is light. And we've been looking at some of that with the prism. Do y'all remember a prism? I'm not promising you this is the last time I'm going to mention the prism. <laughs> I like to stick with one illustration for a minute because I know you don't remember what I said last week. You know how I know that? I'll ask some of you, and you'll be like, yeah, what was that, what was that about? And I'll even ask my wife sometime. Lord bless her. I love my wife. She's like, wait a second. If I think long enough, I could remember that. <laughs> but the best teachers actually teach with repetition. So if you get my, – my daughter's always messing with me. She's like, if you mention that laminated beam one more time <laughs> – but everybody knows what does it mean? Layers of stronger, right? So, and the fountain, she's like, identity, relationship, purpose. And, but uh, those things help us to remember spiritual truth, though. And uh, I think this is a, a really neat picture of God, you know, looking at how light God describes himself as light, describes himself as love. Y'all remember the prism in school? Not the prison, the prism. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like y'all remember the prison of school? <laughs> the prism, when they would bust out the prism, you know, I thought it was cool. And uh, what happens is light shines through that glass. And I don't think in elementary school I can grasp all of it, but I did some Google searching on it. So I understand it better. I feel like an expert now. And uh, what happens is white light, light appears white to us, but it's really made up of a bunch of different colors. But when it passes through that prism, it's fractured. And because white light is made up of reds, blues, and yellows, but those different colors travel at different speeds. So, what happens when it shines through that glass? If I'm wrong, don't tell me, just accept what I'm saying. It travels. <laughs> It travels through that glass. <laughs> I could hear the teacher say, no, that's not exactly correct. Uh, it travels through. Oh, we have a picture of it, uh, don't we? It travels through that glass, and it bends that light, and it makes those uh, different colors break up, and you actually see white light for what it really is. You don't see it that way when it passes through flat glass. There's a whole lot about light and stuff that's really neat and actually reveals a lot about the nature of God. Nature is a reflection of, of God, in fact, because he created all these things, right? So we've taken that to understand just like God is light, there are different aspects of God. There's different aspects of love. I know we would like to choose the best color, you know, our favorite version of God. But we have to look at the whole thing. There's another scripture that says God is a God of war. Exodus 15, verse 3. Oh, my goodness. How does that tie in, Brother Dave, with God is love? Well, it's one of the shades of God, and it's still love. And it's still right, and it's still perfect, and it's still just because he's perfect in all of his ways. Well, then how could a God who's a God of love express himself in war? How does that work? Well, it's right. 
It's pure. It's perfect. It's one of those shades that shine through that prism, right? And I can't just take the version of God that I want. I got to take all of them because he's God and I'm not. He's perfect and I'm not. He is perfect in all of his ways. Can you say amen to that? God is a God who is willing to go to war over what he loves. And the part of this, the nature of God, we looked at it last week, the word hesed, the hesed love of God. The key to this is he's faithful, but it comes down to a connection between his faithfulness and his covenant-keeping nature. So he's love. He's all the ooey-gooey parts of love, too. But if you come cross his covenant with his people, he is ready to go to war with you. His love will cause him to go to war if he needs to over his covenant, over staying faithful to his word, to his people, because he is a covenant-keeping God. And that is part of the love of God. That's part of the nature of God. Exodus 34, 14 says, For you shall not worship any other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Amplified says impassioned. I struggled with that scripture when I was coming up in church as a kid. Like, how can God be jealous? That's weird, you know? No, it's not jealous like you think of a jealous person, like somebody that's jealous of somebody else's car or house or how much money they have. That's, that's not what we're talking about. God's not a man that he should lie. God's not a man like carnal man. He's talking more about jealous of his covenant. More like if you think of a marriage covenant, like a as a husband, I would have a right to be jealous if a dude is flirting with my wife. Would that make me carnal? No. I have a covenant with my wife. So you better believe I have a right to be jealous in that situation. And I'm going to keep my covenant. Keep your hands and your eyes off my wife. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, thank you, Jesus. You shall not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous, impassioned God. You know what I want us to get from this? And what the Lord's been stirring, God is a passionate God. God is not an indifferent God. He is passionate. He is so passionate, he will go to war if he has to. His love is not lukewarm. His love is red hot. And his love causes him to be passionate. So passionate that he can be jealous if he needs to over his covenant. Young's Literal says that this is zealous. God is a zealous God. He is passionate. He is not indifferent. Indifferent. Y'all remember years ago, Bette Midler sang that song, God is watching us from a distance. Kim's shaking her head like, don't sing it. I'm not going to sing it. But the, the point of the song is like, God's out there somewhere from a distance. He doesn't really care. He set this all up, but he's not really, you know, he's watching. No, he's not. He is he has put his whole self into this whole thing. Every ounce of who he is, he's passionate about you. So passionate that he sent his only begotten son. So passionate that he warred for you. He's not from a distance. He's as close as your next breath. Poor Bette Midler. I'll pray for Bette Midler. <laughs> the danger of indifference is that we become unwilling to war for what we value. What you are unwilling to fight for, you are at risk of losing. And we talked the first week, go back and listen to it, just about how we see right now in this generation such an indifference. Can you imagine if we had to go to war in this nation? Why? I, I mean, people just don't value like they used to. World War II, over 10 million men volunteered to go to war. I do not think we would have a small percentage of that. 
today. Why? Indifference. Come see, come saw. What you're unwilling, though, to fight for, you are at risk of losing. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Are we in the last days? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. It's a lot of things in the last days, right? Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Should we have anything to do with these kind of people? Oh, pastor, we're supposed to love everybody. But you're not supposed to be in covenant with everybody. The last days will be marked with an attitude of indifference. And it's a progression, and we see it in this scripture. It starts with being a lover of my own self. It starts with loving myself more than loving God. It starts with loving my me time more than my God time. It starts with loving, oh, that Sunday morning is easy, Brother Dave, to stay in, right, isn't it? Especially when you work six days a week, five days. And I know everybody needs a break every now and then, but why does it always happen on God's time? Why? Indifference. It's marked in the last days as an attitude of indifference. And it starts with this. I'll put myself before God. Then it comes with, I'll put my pleasures before God. I'll put what I love to do before God. Well, all year long, I wait for hunting season. And you just stop going to church for three months straight. How's that okay? Indifference. An attitude of indifference. Something else is more important. And it's a slippery slope. And it won't be long. You'll be looking at your own shade out of that prism of what you believe God is. And you'll come up with your own form of godliness. And it sounds a little bit like this. Well, I just don't think God minds if I... Well, where does this attitude come from? It's a sign of the last days. And it's a slippery slope before there ain't any power left. Revelations chapter 3 says, I know your works, that you are neither hot, cold, nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This scripture is the definition of indifference. Ah. I don't care. Come see, come saw, whatever. Whatever. That's the word today, right? Whatever. I'm not hot. I'm not cold. God said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. The love of God. No, say that's not me. Say I'm not indifferent. Say it again. I'm not indifferent. God is getting rid of this in every ounce of who we are because we are in the last days, because there are some important kingdom work that needs to happen on the earth, and He needs every single one of us to do it, and an attitude of indifference will not get the job done. God needs a passionate, red-hot group of people in this last day to get this last day revival on the earth. Amen? So the love of God in you, the love of God in me will cause us to rise up in passion and war for something. There's something else that's tied with this indifference. And it is also an attitude of... um, 
that the enemy has allowed to come in. And, and I want you to hear me with a, with a wide open heart. An attitude of the victim. It's, it's really linked to this. Because indifference is, I don't care. Victimhood is, why doesn't everyone care for me? And it's very hard to be passionate about others when all you're passionate about is yourself. You ever walk in a room and somebody's waiting for you to approach them? <laughs> There's a whole way of looking at the world that is just jacked up. Not only is it in, but the enemy has done this, and I'll tell you where he sneaks in, guys, and listen, this real stuff, real issues everybody deals with. But we have to work on this as a body of Christ, on this area of us allowing ourselves to become a victim. No, I'm not a victim. I am a victor. If I wake up every day and the glass is half empty, at some point there is a problem. I've got to realize I've got to get on the victory side. I'm not called to be under. I'm called to be over. This is the father's house, not the baby's house. We got to grow up into the Lord Jesus Christ in all things. Shake yourself up out of anxiety. Shake yourself up out of victimhood. Shake yourself up out of who did what, said what, said what. That's not going to get the job done. In the last days, we've got to rise up in passion. And I'm not just passionate about myself. I'm passionate about somebody else. That wasn't in my notes, but I just felt like the Lord wanted to say that. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Who knows this scripture by heart? Today we're going to talk about passion for the lost. God was not indifferent about the lost. God is passionate about the lost. Aren't you glad he's passionate about the lost? Can we ask ourselves today if we have somewhat become indifferent to the lost? The love of God within us demands a response. God so loved the world that it demanded something. God's passion for the world demanded a response in giving us his one and only son. God was so passionate about the lost that he didn't leave us lost, but he gave us a way to be found. Today we're going to talk about that, and the first thing we want to talk about is passion for every human life. It seems so simple, but let's open our heart to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying today. Oh my goodness, we are in the middle of an election year. Is it upon us or not? This is the time when lines start dividing, right? It's us and it's them. And what's, what's bad about this is I think as Christians, whether or not what political spectrum you fall on, what side of whatever spectrum, I think we forget that first and foremost, we are citizens of heaven. Before long, you won't be looking at the other side as even a human being created in the likeness and in the image of God. Every life is valuable. Can we put a dollar amount on a human life? Just, just try what dollar amount can you put on any human life? Yet we allow a devilish mindset that human life is dispensable. 
Is any life, what about the homeless man sleeping on the side of the road? Is his life worthless? What about the political person that you disagree with that's got all the isms that you just absolutely despise? Is their life worthless? Did Jesus die for them too? No matter the person, and look, this I know this kind of goes across some of our thinking, but we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to work on our thinking. No matter the person, no matter their beliefs, no matter their actions, they are made in the likeness and in the image of God. There is a sacredness that we as believers must uphold and understand from the heart of the Father. Every life is precious. I don't want this just to be grandstanding rhetoric this morning. I want the Holy Spirit to make impressions inside of us. Every life is precious. That's why we fight against the tendency of a church to become a, our little bless me club. We get together and have our version of church. I despise it. We're not going to have it. We are a mission-oriented church. We are after the lost. I'm not after petting you until you like me. If some will like me, some won't like me. If you don't like me, there's so many good churches. We're a mission-oriented church. We're after the lost. We're after those that don't know him yet. We're after the down and outers. We're after the addicts. We're after those who are just completely in need of Jesus. Are we passionate about every human life? Every life is worthy of the redemptive blood of the Lamb. We are too quick to write people off. Do y'all know that? I stand before you this morning. We all have become guilty of this. We all can become indifferent and look at people and label them. We are so guilty of this, y'all, especially now. Writing people off. We're too quick to create lines that divide. We are too quick to pronounce ultimate judgment onto people. Just remember, God so loved all of us. When we were lost, God loved us, every one of us in this room. He valued us when we were in sin. He went to war for us when we were wretched and still sometimes wretched. Can I hear an amen this morning? We need to practice a mindset that values every person that we come in contact with. It's hard to do this when you're selfish. It's hard to do this when you're indifferent. It's hard to do this when you're looking at the world through some lenses that say, how are you treating me? I'm here to love. I'm here to extend the love of God. I, I have his love. I love what he loves. I'm passionate. I'm supposed to be passionate about what he's passionate about. God is a passionate God, and he is passionate about the lost. Can I hear an amen this morning? Next thing is passionate about the destructive power of sin. Well, well, my goodness, that sounds weird. What, what should we be passionate about? This? We should hate sin like he hates sin. Part of having his heart is loving what he loves and hating what he hates. Scripture we're on, John 3.16 says, that whoever believes in him should not perish. People without Jesus are perishing. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. Oh, don't read that scripture. That's not popular today. <laughs> we have grown past that, Pastor Ron. People without Jesus are perishing. We need to be passionate about the destructive power of sin. 
We need to be passionate of the understanding that people that do not know Jesus are on their way to hell. Not are they only on their way to hell. They are perishing right now. We are desensitized to this because we're overexposed to the world. Our phones, our TVs, 24-hour news cycle, human injustice and suffering have become commonplace. I can't tell you, I speak for me personally, how easy it is on the news roll just to scroll over 120 people were just murdered last night with some bomb somewhere. and then, Oh, yeah, it's just another one. Desensitized about the destructive power of sin. We see so much of it that it just becomes normal. Perishing has just become normal for us to see it all the time and be exposed to it all the time. This is the plan of the enemy that we get lulled to sleep in an attitude of indifference towards the destructive power of sin. The destructive power of sin has become normalized. Broken families through divorce has become normalized. Addiction to chemicals, legal or illegal, have become normalized. Pornography has become normalized. Sex before marriage has become normalized. Greed and lust for material things have become normalized. Is anything sin any longer? It is really hard to describe sin to people nowadays. Is anything sin any longer? Because it's so normal. We become indifferent to the loss because being lost is so normalized. You can't really tell the difference nowadays between the lost and the saved any longer. And I'm not trying to be one of them preachers. I'm really not, but we're in the last days. And I don't think that we can be passionate about the cause of Christ without being passionate for the reason he had to come in the first place. He didn't save people so that they can go and stay bound to sin. He saved people so they can be free from sin. It's destructive. Sin is causing you to perish. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Who? All my friends are Christians. They live like this. Says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What's unclean anymore? Well, it's all relative. It's layered and nuanced. (laughs) What's sin to me is not sin to you. Well, that doesn't convict me. I know what the Word says, but let your convictions be your convictions. This whole ball, my dad was, (laughs) everybody knew him as the big loving teddy bear. But, oh, let me tell you, His big claim to fame was absolutes. There's no such thing as relative sin. It's absolutely sin. And we're not going to participate in one ounce of it. We had to have a family meeting to listen to Carmen. My brother's back there, and you can ask him. It is the truth. (laughs) Absolutely, we weren't going to participate. And, you know, I know sometimes we look back and we say, man, we were just too hard-nosed. We were just too this. We were just too that. The problem with that is the line just gets pushed back farther and farther and farther. Well, I guess this is okay. Well, I guess this, well, I guess it's okay to do. Well, I guess before you know it, we're marrying homosexuals in the church. I mean, what? How far does the line have to go before we're actually shocked? Before it's not normal? Come on.
Come out from among them. Be ye separate. We were not created to live a life of sin. It causes perishing. It causes us to perish. It don't work. Do y'all remember in the garden? The father told Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree, it will cause you to die. That's what's going on in humanity today. today. Death. This is what Jesus comes to bring. Everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him would not perish from that tree, but have ever la- God's life. Not, I know we interpret that like you go to heaven for eternity. It's bigger than going to heaven. It's the life of God comes back. You become alive again. Amen. Who's born again in here today? You become alive again. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I've been brought back to life. It's not normal for humanity. It's not normal. Sin is not normal. People lost without Jesus are perishing and experiencing death. And I believe if we're going to be passionate with our Father... We have to be passionate about this, not against the sinner. I already told you, we've got to love every human life. We've got to see the value in every human life. But we've got to also be passionate about what's destroying every human life. Lastly, passionate about the power of the gospel as Andrew comes to the piano. Passionate about the value of every human life. Passionate about the destructive power of sin. But we are passionate about the power of the gospel. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. The gospel of Jesus is the power to set men free. The gospel of Jesus is the power to give eternal life. The gospel of Jesus is the answer to what the world needs. But you don't understand. I'm going to have to see a therapist for three more years before I get set free from. And I know there's some people who really, I really wish I could send some people to the therapist. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) but we have lost sight of the power of the gospel. Do we really believe? Do we really believe in the power of the gospel? Has the power to set men free? Do we really believe it? Not not maybe our version of the prism. The gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him would not perish, but can be restored to life in the Father. Find identity, who we were always meant to be. Lose the insanity of a life, perishing life of sin. Find relationship with the Creator and find our purpose, what we were actually put on this earth for. Jesus. And I think sometimes we become indifferent to this. I think sometimes we, we, we're not convinced that the gospel only will set men free. I think sometimes we lose our passion for the power of the gospel. The answer has always been and will always be Jesus. As we stand to our feet this morning, thank you, Jesus. God, give me your heart for the lost. Come on, let's raise our hands if you want to. There's no... 
have to. If you want to just, that's just one way we say, Lord, I open myself up to you. Lord, give me a heart for the lost. That's my heart's cry today. You've been challenging us, Lord, not to be lukewarm, not to be just (laughs) indifferent. I'm asking you today, and as a pastor of the Father's house, I'm asking you today, God, for a greater passion for the lost. Every single one of us here today, some awesome people, Lord, we're asking you, Father, where we've become indifferent. Maybe we've let our political sway a cause that lines to divide, Lord, even that we're not able to see human life like you see them. Every human life. Let's be careful, men and women of God. Listen to me. Listen to me. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying what's right or what's wrong, but even an illegal immigrant... Let's not draw a line that causes us to say they're not worthy of Jesus. I'm a citizen of heaven first. I'm not making political stands. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is I've got to have his heart. If they're living and if they're breathing, they are made in the image and the likeness of the Lord God Almighty. They are something about them is sacred and they're special to God. They're special to me. And Lord, I want to be passionate about that. And I don't want to be blind, Lord, to the destructive power and nature of sin. I help open my eyes, Lord, because it's become so normal. Help open my eyes, Lord. And make me passionate, more passionate about the power of the gospel. You know, I don't have to be responsible to make them receive it. But I certainly have to be passionate about giving it. Lord, when given the opportunity, let this be our prayer. When given the opportunity to be a witness for you, And share the simple gospel that sets men free. Lord, let me walk through that door.